This has been a fun conference, yes? 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 I think PPK and everybody have done a fabulous job. I think they deserve a round of applause. I'm very happy to be here in Amsterdam. Uh, uh, it is my favorite city in Europe, for sure. <laughs> and now we know who the Amsterdam folks are. Um, uh, before I get started, uh, a couple of, of bookkeeping things. One thing is if you want a copy of the presentation, all you have to do is send an email to presentations at uie.com with the subject line mobilism, and uh, I will send you a PDF of the slides for today. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I don't know if you know this, but to give the closing presentation at a conference like this, turns out there are several ground rules that I am forced to follow. Uh, one is that I'm not allowed to mention Ethan Marcote's uh, responsive web design article. Uh, at all, uh, nor am I allowed to quote either Jeremy Keith or Tom Coates. Uh, that's already been done. Uh, no more statistics of World Wide Web uh, use. Uh, 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 I'm not allowed to demo either Werfel or PhoneGap. Uh, no fighting bears. And I can't defer any questions to, to Brian Rieger. <laughs> I say that, that's that that so I'm done. That's all. I don't have anything to say because that's what I was planning to do. Uh, no, instead uh, I'm going to talk about Coca-Cola because I'm an American and that's what we bring with us. Um, the Coca-Cola. Uh, I don't know if they do it here, but in the states they have these contests and uh, they, these funky little things where they create these uh, colored caps. And underneath the colored caps are a code that uh, you can then go to their website, mycokerewards.com, and enter the code in where you can then uh, accrue points, and with the points you can buy all sorts of things, including more Coca-Cola. This uh, is how it looks on a browser, and this is how it looked on an iPhone. <laughs> My favorite part is it tells you that you have to get the Flash player as if that's going to do anything for you. Uh, Coca-Cola isn't the only major brand to, to sort of miss the mark here. Uh, this is Fox Sports, or Fox Weather. Uh, if you try and load their page, you'll notice it says here, I'll turn it Alternate HTML content should be placed here, <laughs> apparently by the user. <laughs> and to do that, you have to get Flash. In uh, Washington, D.C., uh, Washington, D.C. Is, is not a state. It is a, it is a city in a district, the District of Columbia. And interestingly enough, the District of Columbia gets no elected government. Uh, even though that's actually unconstitutional in the United States because you're not allowed to have taxation without representation, and boy, are they taxed. Uh, 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 they, they don't. But they do, have, they do have fake elections for what's called shadow representatives. And I was, we were just walking through the streets, and I saw this sign, and I was intrigued because it was the first time I'd seen a political sign with a QR code on it. And so I clicked on the code, uh, uh, to be brought to Mike Panetta's shadow website, which uh, is only a, a, a small portion of itself. This is, this is how it showed up on my site. Uh, uh, and it's not just uh, uh, politicians that, that, that have issues with this. Uh, this is a bank in the middle of Michigan. This was the sign in their branch uh, had this uh, uh, picture of this Nokia phone with with a fully rendered page, which was awesome. <laughs> I, apparently they can run Photoshop on their site. Just, <laughs> just, uh, but when I actually went to the URL they were advertising on my phone, uh, it wasn't nearly as usable in, in that same way, and of course had that big sort of flash gap in the middle. Uh, this is from the Marriott Corporation. This is a, a website uh, that you get when you're at a Marriott Hotel and you want to use the internet. Of course, it's easy 
this is how it loads, and it's easy from here to figure out what you're supposed to click on to get to the internet. It's that. <laughs> All right. And of course, once you get there, you have to fill out this form. And you don't want this. You actually don't want that. What you want is that. Uh, and the reason all of this looks this way is because of something known as Sturgeon's Law. Sturgeon's Law came from uh, a guy named Theodore Sturgeon. He's a science fiction writer, and he was at a science fiction convention. And a member of the mainstream press walked up to him after he'd given a talk and asked him, uh, uh, why is 90% of science fiction writing crap? And Sturgeon thought for a second, and came back with an appropriate answer, which is 90% of everything is crap. <laughs> this is Sturgeon's law. <laughs> and mobile web design is not immune to Sturgeon's law. Web design in general is not immune to Sturgeon's law. United Airlines sent me an email. It was a brand new email format that they'd used. Someone had come up with a new email template, which I, I'm always impressed when there are new email templates because you can't find anyone who will design email templates. Uh, it's a dark art in the HTML world, and every designer walks backwards really fast <laughs> when, when you suggest that they might do it. But uh, uh, they sent this to me. And so I started playing with it. I was very intrigued by this My Account uh, button right there. And I clicked on that to get a page. This is my favorite page. It says, no, you did not make a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> We've redesigned our website. Unfortunately, the URL you requested is no longer valid. I requested it 10 seconds ago from an email you sent me two minutes ago. <laughs> How, how quickly do they expire their URLs at United? Not as quickly as they get off the ground, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but of course, what would you expect from a company that doesn't know which direction up is? <laughs> this is for passengers. They, 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 they go for a diverse audience. They have passengers who are both portrait and landscape. <laughs> I am ho so hoping these people don't work on their planes. <laughs> uh, I, I want to admit I wasn't being completely fair to the Coca-Cola website. Uh, uh, this is what it looked like uh, when the iPhone first came out. It currently looks like this. So if you go to mycokerewards.com, you'll get this page. So this is a little better rendered than the, than the please download flash page. But uh, in order to uh, request your My Coke Rewards, you uh, have to enter your number here in that tiny little box. Uh, but that's after you log in with your password over here. Again, uh, uh, and, and of course, you have to press this little tiny button up here to, 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 to do that or to register if that's what you want to do. Um, and this is all, you know, unreadable because it's not designed for mobile, right? And I am shocked, right, how many large companies still fall into this trap. Uh, one of the big phone carriers in the United States, Verizon, uh, their site doesn't render on a phone. Nor does AT&T's iPhone 4 site render on an iPhone 4 properly. But that's OK. Neither does Apple's. <laughs> so it's Sturgeon's law is in full force amongst even the major corporations. Air Canada, if you go to their website, in order to check in for your flight, you have to uh, 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 click on this thing and select from every country in the world which one you want to go to. And, or, uh, uh, and then from there, you get this unusable form to be able to click in. And as we know, this, it isn't hard, it isn't impossibly hard to uh, produce websites that actually just come up right when you first go to the URL. 
you know. For one thing, Boston.com can do it, and, and uh, it, they have never been the hallmark of technology at that particular site. They are the, the existing Boston.glove site that's currently being, I've been corrected, it's not being redesigned, it's being created from scratch again, whatever that means. Um, but they are able to do this. You know, the New York Times is able to do this. So 10% of sites are well done, and the other 90% are not. And the question is, where do you land in Sturgeon's Law? Right? Where do you want to be there? And it's actually really hard to be in that top 10%. That's a real challenge. So being able to do that is difficult. Now, the reason I bring all this up is that my interest is actually not that much in designing mobile websites. I, I, I'm interested in helping teams do that. But my interest has been in the fact that why are we talking about this now? Mobile design, or designing for mobile, mobile web, has been around for what, 10 years? Right? Phones have had capability to do this for a really long time. Phones have had reasonable browsers for a while. The iPhone is, is going on five years old. So this is not new, yet in the last year or so, for some reason, mobile is big. Every event that I go to, if there's a topic on mobile, that's the one that sells out. That's the one that, that fills up the room. So everyone is all of a sudden paying attention to it. And it's not just the devs and the designers, it's the executives, it's, it's uh, uh, the copy folks, it's everybody. Everybody is suddenly interested in this. And so I was really interested in trying to figure out why now? What is it that's happening now? And what I've realized is that we've sort of come into this perfect storm of, uh, of, of opportunity in the mobile space. All of a sudden, all these forces are coming together. And so what I wanted to talk about is what those forces are. Now, one of them is Sturgeon's Law, because with the fact that Apple has sold a boatload of iPhones, and then all the other phone manufacturers came out and made iPhone-like phones, except for Nokia and RIM, who are sponsors of this event. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, because everybody uh, has sort of swarmed in on this idea, uh, that 90% crap thing is now visible to a much broader audience. And stakeholders, executives, they're paying attention to this. You know, they, 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 they're ashamed to bring up their own company's website on their phone and show it to their friends. So that's one force. Sturgeon's Law turns out to be a very strong force for change because when you're in that 90% crowd and people notice, you, you start to push on this. So that's one thing. But there's another, uh, uh, what I would call, uh, theory that guides us on how this works, and that's called market maturity. Market maturity is a theory that's been around for, I, I first started writing about it in uh, like 1994, and it was a, a theory that was used to express why it was sometimes difficult to get people to make more usable designs, and other times it was really easy. And so I started working on this theory as to what this is, and we call it market maturity. This is a Wang 2200 word processor. Uh, it was created, it was invented and, and, and sold in 1979. Just out of curiosity, how many people here were not even born in 1979? Oh, that's disturbing. <laughs> I worked on this machine. <laughs> It sucks when you talk to audiences who are younger than, than the projects you worked on. <laughs> I am an old geezer. Um, the Wang 2200 was a word processor. It was a device. All it did was word processing. It stood this tall. It was this wide. It cost $14,000. And the only thing it would do is word processing. It did not do spreadsheets because they were not invented yet. <laughs> okay. 
They, they, were, they had two more years to spreadsheets. This is all it did. If you wanted to learn how to use this device, you had to go and take a course in Lowell, Massachusetts, a beautiful little city. And uh, in Lowell, you, you, would, you would go for a one-week course. And in that one-week course, you would learn how to load a file, how to save a file, how to print a file, and how to change the ribbon. That was week one. <laughs> the advanced course was week two, where you got to learn bold and italics. <laughs> italics was hard, because you had to change the daisy wheel. So this was not a very usable device, because it took two weeks to learn how to do bold. <laughs> but it was a, uh, uh, people would pay for that. They were fine with it, because it was the only device that would do word processing. So people were, were fine with paying for just that. Eventually, we moved past this. And we went to products like, uh, 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 Word Perfect. Word Perfect was, was a product where, where they just kept evolving it. They just kept adding things to it over and over and over again. They added so many things that in order to learn to use this thing, what you had to do was you, you, they gave you these little cardboard cutouts that you would put over your keyboard. And, and they would give them uh, uh, other cardboard cutouts that you put around your monitor. And there were some that you would put around your bathroom window. And, and all of them were, were, were intended to remind you how to use the program because it was so complicated to use. And then uh, a little startup in Redmond came out with a, with a program called Word. And Word didn't require any of those things because it used pull-down menus and, and a novelty of a mouse. And it became this simple little thing. And all of this is because things go through stages. There's an evolutionary process. We start by just focusing on the technology, just trying to make the technology work. Then we move to a world where we're just adding feature after feature after feature. And only when we've had so many features that nobody could care less. I mean, there's nothing you could put into a word processor today that anybody would care about. Only when we get to that point do we move to thinking about experience. So all of a sudden, we jump from thinking about features to thinking about experience. Now, after a while, we get back into the world of features. <laughs> and there's sort of a cycle that happens. And we see this in the world of mobile phones, right? This was the technology for mobile. This is the world where we got into features. We even now call them feature phones, right? And the iPhone forced us into this world where we started to think about experience. So that pattern keeps continuing. And it happened in the world of, of what Luke referred to as the desktop web, right? Where, you know, we had this world of features with AltaVista. And that shifted to a world of Google. This is Google's original screen, right? They've made it even less dense than this uh, uh, to experience here. And we see it in terms of the websites that are built. This is the site map of a, of a site called AccuWeather that tells you the weather. And apparently, you need all of these functions to tell you what the weather is. That's a lot of functionality. But guess what? People don't want that anymore. So we see other things emerging, like a website called Umbrella Today, where you put in the name of your city, and then it says, yes. <laughs> or no, depending on what's going on. Oh, that's, I mean, this is experience, right? Features versus experience. Back at Air Canada, right, they have a site that they have created that's riddled with experience, or riddled with features, I mean. I mean, just look at the site map. It just goes on and on and on and on and on, right? That's just amazing. So porting this to the web required making some cuts and bringing it back down 
you know, if we're going to put it on mobile, all of a sudden, there's this interface. But it turns out they also have an old-fashioned WAP like phone interface, an M dot, if you know about it. And sure enough, features experience. And that's the pattern that keeps going. This, if you go to San Francisco and you Google BART schedule, with BART being the, the subway system that goes uh, around the Bay Area, uh, 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 you get this lovely unreadable map. If you were smart enough to not Google it, but go to the MDOT site, you get this beautiful time schedule interface. So again, we, we, we have this. And there are sites like Amazon, which, which have been brilliant. I don't know if you've seen exactly what the Amazon web experience is like, but in the States, this is what it looks like. You can, uh, uh, it's a very different experience than their normal website. You can search for books, you can uh, uh, look for things, and, and beyond the home page, the actual experience renders really nicely, really cleanly. It's easy to find a book, to get to the reviews, to see what the entire thing is all about. Uh, all of those features are there. They've managed to keep the most important stuff, but they deliver a great experience. And they do it well. And Amazon is the only one who's doing this. There's been talk today about Best Buy, just to show you in case you haven't seen what the Best Buy site looks like. This is what happens if you want to buy a TV. You actually get into this beautiful little uh, TV finder where you can select various parameters for your TV and drill down into them and from there uh, uh, be able to, to get to a specific TV that matches your needs based on, on specific features. Again, delivering a very clean, sweet uh, experience for folks. And that progression of first just getting it to talk, right? The technology phase we call the talking horse phase, which is based on an old joke about a guy walking into a bar and saying to the bartender, oh my God, I just had the most incredible thing. I just had a conversation with, with, with this horse. And he goes on and on about how he had this conversation with the horse. And finally the bartender said, what did the horse say? And the guy says, who gives a shit? <laughs> right? The fact that it talked was the bloody miracle. And that's where we were for the longest time. We were dealing with the talking horse. The fact that I could bring up a site at all was the bloody miracle. Who gave a shit as to what the site actually did, right? And, and so that's the technology phase. And then we move to the feature phase where we just keep adding stuff and adding stuff. And then we move to the experience phase where we actually have to remove functionality in order to get to the uh, uh, things that we need. So there's this process of, of, of moving it. And in essence, the customers, it's called market maturity because the market decides. You don't get to decide where you are in this process. Your marketing people would love you to push ahead, but it's the customers who will ask for either features or better experience. And when they're, when they're ready, they'll make the shift. And once they make the shift, Boom, you're there. And here's the big thing. Companies that get stuck in features and, and are like the market leaders in the feature space rarely make it to the experience space. They get, they get clobbered on the experience side because they've got all this dead weight of all those features to have to migrate, whereas the new companies are starting from scratch in many instances. You know? It's not an accident that Apple did not have a phone in the business before the iPhone. They didn't have a code base, they didn't have a technology base, they didn't have a manufacturing process that they had to bring over. They were pretty much there, starting with experience, and they changed the game. And then everybody quickly created iPhone-like clones, except for RIM and Nokia. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> I know who paid for my flight home. <laughs> so. Not that I wouldn't want to stay in Amsterdam. I don't want you to get that wrong. I do want to go home eventually. OK, I've dug that hole deep enough. So those are the first two sort of points of the storm. But there's another thing that that's sort of come in. This is another thing that we've been noticing for the past year. And this is the difference between activities and experience. This is a map of Six Flags 
Magic Mountain. It's a, a, a theme park in Southern California. And people who go to Six Flags Magic Mountain go uh, uh, pretty much experience the park all the same. It's, it, there's a pattern to the way they experience it. The way you go is, is you, you come into the park and you uh, uh, go up to the first ride you can find. Usually there's a long, long line, so you wait in line for a really long time. You finally get to the front. You then get on the ride, which lasts for a really short time. Uh, and then that's done, and you get off the ride, you find some place to throw up, and then you go and get in another line. And if you look at the map, what you notice is it's got all of the rides on it. You can clearly see all of the rides in the park, because the goal of a Six Flags attendee is to get in as many rides between each time you throw up uh, as possible. So. That's where you go. And so people go from ride to ride to ride, and they've got fabulous rides, and they really love it. But the, 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 the point of the map is to get you from one ride to the next. Now contrast that to Walt Disney World's Magic Kingdom, where it's actually hard to see any of the rides. Sure, if you are a fan of the Magic Kingdom, you may recognize some of the architectural standpoints. But none of the rides are actually listed or pointed out on the map. That's completely missing here. They have rides. They have very cool rides. But that's not how Disney thinks of themselves. They don't think of themselves as a place you go on rides. They think of it in terms of an adventure. The adventure starts with uh, uh, the, the costume breakfast the character breakfast. If you bring a small child to Walt Disney World, which I highly recommend you do, one of the things you can do is you can sign up for a character breakfast. Now, if you've never done this, it's a chance for your small child to get up close and personal to a creepy guy in a large animal suit <laughs> and watch them cook breakfast together. It's an awesome experience for everyone involved. And just saying. And this is what you start your day with. You start your day with probably the most expensive breakfast you will ever pay for. And, uh, and, and you, you, you then start your day in the park, and you then wander from activity to activity, from, from place to place. There are adventures everywhere you go. Everything is, is, is a new land, a new place. It's, it's, it's something to explore. You get all the way through the park, and finally, you, are, uh, you find yourself uh, at the end of the day when the amazing fireworks show starts. And it never seems to end. It just goes and it goes. And you can see it clearly from wherever you are in the park. And then finally, you take your very tired child and you put them on your shoulder and you bring them uh, um, uh, home and you uh, 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 back to the to a hotel room. But they don't call it a hotel room. They call it a resort. So you go back to your room at the resort, and you open the door to the room at the resort, and you walk in, and the first thing you notice is that someone has made animals out of uh, uh, all of the towels. <laughs> well, let's do that again. I like that so much. Uh, uh, uh. In, in your room, they've made these origami animals out of uh, all of the towels. And... It's incredible, right? I mean, it's just, it's just awesome. And if you have, if you, your kids left the toys there, they actually arrange the toys around the animals as if they'd been playing while you were gone. And then, and then of course, collapsed into their positions when you walked in the room, just like in the movie, right? And that's, that's Disney. That's how Disney thinks about the world, right? And, and that's, that's their, their idea of, of, of designing things. And if you think about this, uh, uh, the way to divide this up is that Six Flags is basically about experiences. I'm sorry, activities. Disney is about experience. And that's the difference between activity and experience. Activity are these discrete things that happen. Right? You go from one ride to the next ride to the next ride. Experience is making sure everything blends. Everything is connected. You design all of the interstitial activity in addition to the big touch points. 
In San Francisco, it is difficult on a rainy night to hail a cab. It's not true? Uh, that's probably New York. It's difficult in New York to hail a cab, too. In many cities in the United States, <laughs> the WebKit guys are into precision. Have you noticed this? <laughs> and we thank them for it. Uh, uh, in many cities in the United States, it's, it can be difficult to hail a cab in the middle of the night. Thank you. <laughs> there is a service that has gone into service in, first in San Francisco and now in other cities where, in fact, uh, you can, uh, uh, you have a, uh, an app on your iPhone or a website that you can visit, and you can hail a cab. It's called Uber Cab. And the way it works is after you've established your account, uh, which you, uh, you have to do in advance, it's one downside, uh, you establish your account, including giving them a credit card number to charge, you then uh, at any point in time can call a cab by just bringing it up, it looks at the location services, it figures out where you are, you just say, I need a cab here. And it then sends a message out to cab drivers who have a similar but not the same app running on their phone and tells them that someone is looking for a cab and where they are, and a driver says, I'll take that. And then, all of a sudden, the status of the, of the cab is now being communicated to the customer, so you can see the cab on the map as it's getting closer to you. And you can actually call the driver, and, or the driver can call you to say, hey, it's raining, I'm going across the street into the coffee shop and, and I'll, I'll be there uh, um, uh, uh, for a little bit. Uh, just let me know when you get close. So the, the, the whole experience of getting a cab changes. And even when it's time to pay, Instead of fumbling around at the end looking for change for the meter, you instead, uh, the driver just says done, and a message comes up on your phone that says ready to pay, and you pay, and you're done. You rate your driver, your driver also rates you as a customer, and, <laughs> right? <laughs> And everybody moves along, and the that your receipt is emailed to you, your credit card is charged, and everything happens really quickly. This is UberCab. They have changed it from a set of activities to an experience. Uh, we also have in the States, I think you might have it here now, Groupon? Is this here? Okay. So, uh, uh, are you guys as big a sucker for this stuff as I am? Because I, like, buy them. I, I, like, bought a facial the other day. I don't even know what a facial is. <laughs> it sounded good. <laughs> it said I would be soft and supple. <laughs> so... <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so the, the, uh, the way this works, of course, is, is, is they, have, they have the ability, you can bring up, not only see what your account is on your phone, but if you happen to forget to print out the little receipt, you can actually just show your phone and they can scan it right there under the number and they have uh, the coupon there. And so we have this sort of connection uh, in between the gaps. That, that, uh, now, a lot of this currently is happening because of QR codes. QR codes, of course, are spreading. This is from Melbourne, Australia. Just wandering around, we saw this wall, and on the wall was this that said, you know, you can live here. There was a building being built on the other side of the wall. And so, just dying to know what was there, I brought up the website, and there was this really nice, you know, easy to use uh, uh, mobile form that allowed me to get uh, my information in, so I could actually figure out if, if you know, this is the place I want to live, I can give them my information, they can contact me, I can do that right there. So no longer do I have to go home and, you know, write phone numbers down and go home and call somebody and make an appointment. All this stuff is, is sort of made between the gaps. And, you know, QR codes are now showing up everywhere. This is in the Denver airport. Uh, this is at uh, uh, Kevin Chang's wedding. Kevin Chang is the product manager for, for Twitter uh, desktop, and uh, his wedding, uh, uh, one of the guests wore a QR code on their hat, which 
said, uh, congratulations to Kevin and Coley, may your love be forever true and never false. This was because they got married on 10-10-10, which was a binary day. <laughs> Geek love. This is what happens when geeks fall in love. So, this, you know, this is there, but I think QR codes are actually very temporary because I think once we get near field communication techniques, uh, RFID and, and near field radio, uh, you won't even need this. You'll just sort of walk by things and your phone will start shouting ads at you. It'll be exciting and fun. Um, so, but that idea of, of, of discrete activities versus experience turns out to be a, a key one because it's easy to de design for the activities. We just figure out what those are and we, and we build for them. Figuring out what the whole experience is, understanding what those gaps are, that's really difficult. But mobile fits into that space really well. So all of a sudden it gives us a tool that we didn't have before to actually act in that space. And that's, I think, a major reason why all of a sudden mobile is playing into this and, and we see activity and experience sort of being a contributor. That we didn't have a few years ago, we now have. So that's pushing us to us. And the last piece of this has to do with what I call the Kano model. The Kano model is, is based on a, a Japanese behavioral economist theory. His, his name was Kano, Jirajaki Kano. And he, uh, he had this idea that you could look at the two dimensions. On one dimension, you could look at, in essence, the satisfaction of the customer or the user. And you can measure that dimension from uh, frustration, a very frustrated customer, to delight, a very delighted customer. And on the other dimension, you could look at the investment that the team makes in, into uh, building this thing. And you could then predict some things. And what he found was that there were some really predictable patterns. There were three basic patterns that emerged. One is called the performance payoff. And the way the performance payoff works is that uh, the more you invest, the better the, f the, the customer's satisfaction gets because you're just building features they want, right? So this is sort of that sort of feature model. You just keep investing, and if you invest more, you get more returns. But there's another uh, part of this model that doesn't follow that, another pattern. And that kind of called basic expectations. And the way basic expectations work is that uh, you can invest a lot but you can never get above neutral satisfaction, right? So uh, if, I, if I have a calculator and I decide to invest in a brand new algorithm for multiplication, no one's going to get excited about this and buy this calculator because it multiplies better or faster. It's just not gonna happen. Now if I screw up multiplication, <laughs> that's gonna cause people to get frustrated. But investing in better multiplication is not going to enhance the user's experience. At best, I get neutral. Right. We see this now, for example, with Wi-Fi. Right? Um, uh, Wi-Fi at conferences. If the Wi-Fi works, people are, are okay with it, right? But if it doesn't work, people get upset. But no one says, oh, I'm gonna go to this conference because they're gonna have free Wi-Fi. Right? It's not a selling point. Now, uh, the last pattern are what are called excitement generators. And the way these work is that you make some investment, and oftentimes it doesn't even have to be a lot of investment. And whatever that investment is, if you do it in the right thing, you magically get delight. You get delight, really delighted customers. So one of the first things on the, on the phones to do this was an application called Shazam. It was absolutely delightful for the users. You, you, take, you hear something on the radio or in a club, uh, and you take out your phone and you point it at the speaker, which at a club usually means somewhere in the bathroom, because that's the only place you can hear. And 
So you see all these people in the bathroom are holding their phones up. And the, uh, 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 it listens to the music, and about a minute later, it tells you what the song is. And turns out that uh, this is really delightful to people who've never experienced this sort of thing before. They just, they just think this is awesome. And they get very excited about it. And, and you, it's not hard to do this. I tweeted upon landing that I had made it to Dulles Airport, IAD. And as soon as I tweeted that, I got a response back from a company I'd never heard of before called Limo Res, saying, uh, need a ride? I didn't, but I checked them out anyways. And so I clicked on their link, and it brought up this, this nice little website, which uh, could have been designed better. They're a limo company. I'll give them that. But interestingly enough, it had everything I needed on it. It told me what the rate would be to go where I needed to go, and it had a, you know, a nice little ability for me to call them and get the information. So this, for me at that moment, was delightful. It's like, oh, cool, this is a company I could just call and get a ride if I needed one. So that uh, was, was, was very exciting. Now, contrast this with Google Docs. Google Docs, it, it's this, this uncanny valley thing that a couple of people have mentioned today. It, it does it almost. It works just like the desktop feature, almost. But the thing that makes Google Docs most useful to many users is the fact that you can share documents. But if you bring up the document on the phone, which you can do, there's no capability for sharing from the phone. That functionality has been left off. So you have to power up your laptop and get a connection and, and, and share the document from there. There's no way to email it. There's no way to send it. There's no way to, to, to communicate this. It's a major feature for many users, but it doesn't work. So the thing is, is that that feature is such a big part of Google Docs right now that it's hard to make sharing any better that would be any more delightful, but it's definitely going to piss people off. And it doesn't meet that basic expectations curve. And so that's what we talk about. That's the, this whole sort of uncanny valley thing when we're talking about apps is we have expectations, basic expectations that things work a certain way, and they're going to break when that happens. Uh, back to my Coke rewards. Let's say I do want to register. So I have to press the little registration button here. And then I have to. Uh, uh, I'm told that this is as easy as one, two, three, and I have to then put in my birth date and uh, 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 my gender because uh, apparently they need to know that to, to, to offer me more Coke. Uh, and then I need to fill out a massive amount of name and address followed by uh, username and password. Uh, uh, information, and then I get to scroll down even more, and from there, uh, uh, did ask, determine whether I want to receive email flashes from them, which, which sounds a little dirty, um, which are different from mobile news flashes, whatever the hell those are, and then I have to prove to them I'm human because robots are signing up for free coke all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Contrast that with the sign-up experience for Groupon, which is this. Enter your name, enter your email address, enter your password twice because your thumbs are not accurate, and then click to say you've read the terms of agreement, which they know you damn well haven't read. <laughs> and uh, uh, that's it. That's the whole, whole process. Very simple. One more thing about the Kano model. Things that are delighters today, over time, become basic expectations. That's what happened with the Wi-Fi at conferences, right? It used to be, when you went to a conference that had Wi-Fi, it's like, oh, cool, they have Wi-Fi, right? Now, if you go to a conference and they don't have it, you're pissed. Like, what do you mean they don't have Wi-Fi? I'm out of here. 
I have to go to sessions and not read my email? That's not happening. <laughs> right? So if I'm going to do that, I might as well not go to the sessions because I have to read the email. Whatever happened to just being here? It doesn't happen anymore. We have to be here, but we have to bring everything with us. And then we have to tweet that we're here for all the people who aren't here. <laughs> so they could wish they were here while they're checking their mail. <laughs> Sending us mail saying, hey, how come you haven't mailed me? <laughs> I'm at the conference. <laughs> Tweeting and checking my mail. <laughs> so that's, this is basically Kano's model. Again. It's, 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 there's nothing new here. This is, this is the way Kano's model has been around for 25 years. But it tells us a lot about what's been happening in the mobile space because we see that all of this stuff is, is really coming together in the center. And uh, it's sort of forcing us to think about things. And that's why I think mobile has taken off, why it's the big thing for the next few years. And it's cool, we're all part of that. But there's a downside to this too. Because at my company, User Interface Engineering, we've been studying what it takes to do really successful experiences on mobile. And what it takes is actually really complex. There's a lot that goes into it. So for example, uh, one of the things, which hasn't really been talked about here today, is that Great mobile experiences involves really good copy. You've got that, all that stuff we're trying to render in the browser so that we can have it all look great, it has to say something. And what it has to say has to be compelling and meaningful and useful to the users. So we, on our team, we need to have good copywriters. Uh, we also need to be able to organize stuff in a logical way. And on the small screen, that means, you know, having really concise, useful menus that are there. The design process, because a lot of this stuff, particularly on, on, on web-based applications, a lot of this stuff uh, gets pushed really fast. So we have to have a process that, that, that understands how to iterate quickly and, and get results. And of course, we have to test those results and see how they're working. So we need uh, to have really good user research capabilities and, and be able to understand what's going on. And those users are all going to be interacting with the design, so we need to understand rich interactions, particularly with things like the jQuery mobile toolkit. All of a sudden, we get a tremendous amount of interaction that happens there. And we're also presenting large amounts of information on these tiny screens. We need to render that in a way that people can see it and understand and work with it. So that's information design. And there's a complete component of visual design to make this stuff not just look good, but also communicate. Uh, what the mo highest priority information is and basically hide the lesser priority information until the user needs it. And that's what good visual design is about. And finally, there's a whole process of deciding what's in and what's out. This whole design for the desktop first is a process of editing and curating, making sure that we say no to the things we're supposed to say no to. So we have to have all these skills. And unfortunately, it doesn't stop here. Because in order to pull this off, we actually have to go out and meet our customers and be able to understand how they're going, doing, and what they're doing. We have to understand the basic domains that we're working in. So if we're in medical science or we're in telecom, we have to understand how those, how those domains work. Or we have to understand how the business works. How the hell do we make money off of this thing? What that, what, what's that model all about? We've got a tremendous amount of data coming in, so we have to understand uh, uh, how to take that data and use it in a useful way in our designs. And of course, we have to tell people People what the value of what we're doing is. So we have to have that capability. We need to be able to understand the underlying technology platforms, which are changing every minute. And that's just driving us nuts. We have to be able to explain why what we're doing is going to be valuable and how we're going to get the value back from that. And that's what return on investment is all about. We need to understand the fact that this is no longer a person talking to a machine, but we, in fact, are interacting with other people. So we have all these social components that are now interacting with what we're doing. We have to be able to deal with the the fact that we have to translate that into instructions that we give to the dev team so that they can implement this thing in a meaningful way using the development processes that they are trying to use in order to get this stuff out fast. So we have to have all those skills too. 
and it doesn't stop there. Because what we've been finding is that to do really good experience design, there are these soft skills that are really key. In order to be a really good designer, you have to have a good ability. Presentation skills are key, and we have to be able to facilitate those types of meetings and generate ideas and get people moving forward. And so facilitation skills are there. These are all the skills that we need in order to get really great web designs out there, mobile or not. And here's the kicker. We've been studying these things for 10 years now, and in that 10-year process, the teams have been getting smaller while the number of skills have been going up. So we have to do this smarter. Now, in our research, where we've gone out, we've studied teams that are really good at producing great designs. Organizations like the Apple, like Netflix in the United States, uh, uh, but not just people who've done things digitally. We've looked at other organizations that do things really well, like Virgin America, the airline, or, or uh, Cirque du Soleil, the circus. So we, we've studied what does it take for them to, to, to pr consistently produce great stuff while their competitors struggle. So we would actually, we, did, we studied 20 companies that were really amazing at designing really great stuff consistently, and we studied 20 organizations that were competitors, direct competitors to them, that struggled at this, like, you know, uh, uh, Blockbuster instead of Netflix, or, or um, uh, Microsoft for Apple, or, or uh, uh, Ringling Brothers for Cirque du Soleil. And we, we, we went out, we looked at these folks, and we tried to figure out what the successful organizations were doing that the struggling organizations were struggling with. And we collected up about 2,000 variables, and we put them into this huge uh, statistical machine, and it popped out three questions that turned out to be key to successful design. And the three questions uh, uh, are this. Uh, the first one is called the vision question. And we can walk up to any team member and ask them this question. Can you tell us what it's like to use, to experience your design five years from now? And so we have this five-year vision. And we picked five years because it's far enough out that it gets us past the legacy problems that we have. Right? Because we have all these legacy things that are holding us back, old databases and old technology and IE5 and all this stuff. But five years from now, that should all be gone except for IE5. <laughs> so we should be able to be past that. The, uh, um, so, so being there is key, right? Five years. But it's the whole idea of the experience, right? We're not asking what the actual design is. We're asking what the experience is. And that probably isn't going to change that much. The actual design implementation, that's going to change. But five years is not so far out that we're in the world of jetpacks and flying cars and, and that promised future we've never had. And so that's key. And the reason that we look at a vision like this is because you can think of the vision as basically this, this stake, this flag that I put in the sand. And the, the beauty of this flag is that um, Everyone can clearly see it from a distance. Everybody on the team, everyone in the organization can see it. They can march towards it with baby steps, but they can see it, which means no matter where they are in the organization, all the, the only rule they have to follow is march towards the flag, follow the vision. So if everybody understands the vision, they can clearly see it, that's there. The beauty of it is it's stuck in the sand. And even though it is, it is out there in the sand and everyone's marching towards it, all I have to do is pick it up and move it someplace else. And because everyone can clearly see it, they can now just march towards that one. And so the experience vision turns out to be absolutely key. So this question, can everyone on the team describe the experience of using the design five years from now? is what tells us whether an organization is actually going to end up in that pile of struggling companies or in the collection of, of uh, uh, successful companies. We, that's one third of the, the question. 
The second question is what we call the feedback question. And the feedback question is, I should be able to walk up to any member of the team, and by any member of the team, I mean anyone who contributes to the, or influences the design. So it's not just the, the people who are up to their elbows in pixels and, and wireframes and, and uh, CSS, but it's also the stakeholders and the people who come in, even that, that executive that comes in and, and, and uh, uh, does what we call the seagull operation, where they come in and they just swoop down and poop all over your design and then take off. <laughs> the executive poop and swoop. <laughs> right? So any of those people, I should be able to walk up to them and ask them, in the last six weeks, have you spent at least two hours watching someone use your design? Two hours every six weeks, that's the minimum. Everybody on the team should do this. Teams that do this, and the best teams, it's not every six weeks, it's like every two weeks, right? And it's not just two hours, it's like three or four hours, right? But they're constantly getting feedback into their design process. What do I mean by feedback? Well, there's all sorts of techniques from feedback. There's, there's usability testing where you sit next to someone and you watch them use the design. There's different variations on usability testing, like five second tests, which is you basically show somebody a, a screen, like a form for five seconds, you take it away and you ask them questions about it. And if they can't tell you what they just looked at, then you probably have to redesign at least the visual design, if not other pieces of it, uh, possibly the copy. Uh, trade show testing, or what we call cafe testing, where you actually go into cafes with a laptop or a phone and you just sit next to people and you give them uh, 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 a little money to just give you some feedback. Um, uh, remote usability testing where you, you use a WebEx or some sort of uh, remote screen sharing capability to do this. Field studies where you, you literally go into the field and you meet with people. It's uh, a simple technique uh, uh, where, you, where you just do that. Sitting and listening to customer support actually just jacking into the customer support system, listening to the questions. It's not as good as actually interacting, but hearing the questions coming up over and over again. Or part, watching the user forums, not necessarily explaining things on the forums, but if you have discussions going on, listening to the problems and asking people why they were trying to do the things they were doing, what they were trying to do, and try to get this. And if you're in the world of self-design, uh, uh, which means you're building something for yourself and you've got a big enough audience out there that, that, that is like you that will pay for that, uh, uh, just using it yourself on a regular basis so that if you find something frustrating, you fix it, right? This is feedback, and if you're doing this, it's great. Two hours every six weeks, everybody on the team, so that's key, right? So that's that. The third question is what we call the culture question. And the culture question is the most difficult. It says, in the last six weeks, have you rewarded a team member for a major design failure? By rewarding, I'm meaning party. Go out, have a party to talk about something that didn't go the way you guys had hoped. Spend five minutes making fun of the guy who did it, and the next 20 minutes, seriously talking about all the cool things you just learned because you messed up. And everybody does it. We have one team that we work with that, that uh, uh, they're an agile team, and if someone breaks the nightly build, they have, they're the ones responsible for donuts at the morning stand-up meeting. And the first time someone brings in the donuts, it's, it's, it's a welcome to the club party. Everybody uh, uh, makes a big deal out of it because everybody's broken the nightly build at some point. And talking about why that happened and how you prevent it going forward is key. So these are the three questions that uh, actually get it. And I'm curious, you know, are you guys getting all three of these? Two, one? That's the trick. This is what's going to separate you from an organization that produces, struggles to produce great stuff and is possibly going to end up in that 90% of Sturgeon's Law from the people who end up in the 10% of Sturgeon's Law. So there we are, our perfect storm sort of coming together of Sturgeon's Law, market maturity, activity and experience, and the Kano model. And what I hope you get from this is that there are key things you can do to create great designs. It's not just about having phone gap in your toolkit. Even though it's an awesome tool. 
It's about creating things that people want to use and are delighted from it. And to pull that off, you have to deal with these different elements and understand what's going on. And that's what I came to talk to you about. Again, want copies of the slides? Please, by all means, send me an email, presentations at uie.com with the subject line, Mobilism, and I will get you a copy of the presentation. Thank you very much for encouraging my behavior. So what are we doing? One question. One question. You get one question. This, it better be really good. There's a lot of pressure on whoever asked this question. <laughs> Mike, do you want to answer it? Oh, wow, OK. A question. Mike is being bold. Uh, did that guy in Washington, D.C. won the election? Did, did he win the election? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it matters. <laughs> I don't actually know if Mike Panetta won the election. Actually, I heard he was sort of creepy. <laughs> but I, I don't know. He probably, you know, he, he probably has lovely children. <laughs> I don't know anything about the guy. He's a shadow representative. I don't even know what they do. They complain about how they don't have real representation. I think that's what they do. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.